Well, good morning. Glad you're watching and listening this morning. And uh, we're coming again in this virtual fashion, obviously because of the weather that's outside and uh, it's coming down pretty good right now here uh, in my house. But I'm glad that you're watching and listening along this morning. And uh, if you want to grab your Bible and uh, follow along, we won't have any verses on the screen um, this morning. Uh, just a message from God's Word. We're going to continue in our study uh, concerning uh, the hooks that Satan has for the family, and we started on that um, last Sunday in particular. We started on uh, this thought of those voices, those voices that uh, Satan uses, and we, we talked particularly about uh, the subject of music, and uh, I'm going to give you the rest of those thoughts this morning. Uh, God helping me, I want to be a help, I want to be a blessing there. And uh, so let me encourage you to grab your Bible there. Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to begin. I'm going to have a word of prayer. Uh, just remind you of some things that um, God willing, weather permitting, uh, we're going to be able to um, have uh, going on this week. Um, our young men have a uh, basketball game that's planned at home. Uh, just one home game this week, and that's Tuesday at McKenna Grove at 4 p.m. Uh, remind you about that, 4 p.m. Uh, at McKenna Grove. And uh, so I trust that uh, that'll work out. That's our plan. We'll let you know if something changes there. We're playing Bible Baptist from over in York on uh, Tuesday afternoon. Um, tonight we are supposed to have a missionary. Um, that's somewhat in question right now, with obviously with the weather, what's going on. Uh, I've talked to Brother Shreve. That's his name, Brother Kyle Shreve. And uh, he is over in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania this morning. Uh, for a meeting, and uh, then he is uh, going to drive back down to his family, which is down in Frederick, Maryland, and then uh, plan to come back up this direction. Um, I've talked to him about the possibility and um, of having maybe an earlier service, maybe a 4 p.m. service, and uh, so that's not set in stone yet, but um, I will let you know by 2 p.m. this afternoon uh, through the website, through the Facebook page, and um, uh, I'll let you know, uh, phone phone tree, let you know exactly what the plan is. Um, if we cannot have a service because the uh, weather continues to be inclement through the evening, um, I will plan on posting another uh, Bible message about 5 p.m. That's a different time, of course, uh, than what we normally do. But uh, that's going to be the plan for today uh, as it stands. So be watching. Um, if you're on social media, if you have internet access, obviously if you don't, uh, you wouldn't be listening to this. Uh, so be watching uh, social media and, and our, our church website for updates about 2 p.m. Uh, this afternoon on what the plan is going into the evening hours. Uh, some prayer requests to pass along before we pray and get into the message. Continue to pray for Neil Seats, and uh, he's recovering from an ulcer that they cauterized so I continue to remember him and Sarah as well. Uh, also, uh, remember uh, Pastor Rhodes. Uh, this is Loken's uh, father up in Vermont, and they took him to the hospital last night with what would be classic heart attack symptoms, but they checked him out, and uh, his heart is actually doing well, and so praise the Lord for that. They're going to do some other tests uh, this week to try to determine exactly what's going on there, what's causing these symptoms. So uh, pray concerning his, his health needs. He is back at home now. He got home early this morning, very early. And uh, so do be praying for Pastor Rhodes and uh, the Rhodes family. I know they appreciate that very much. Uh, another request to pass along would be uh, Dean Kinney. And uh, Dean is not doing well. He's been over at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital, actually off and on for months now. Uh, this last time he's been in, uh, tomorrow will be two weeks that he's been in. And uh, he just cannot uh, process food correctly. And uh, so they have to put a feeding tube back in. And uh, just trying to make some wise decisions about his care going forward. Um, it really has the doctors stumped about how, how to help him and what to do. And uh, so do be praying for Dean and his wife Jody and uh, their family. They have uh, three children, uh, excuse me, four children, uh, three boys and a and a and a girl, and uh, they have adult children. Uh, their daughter is married, 
and uh, they have an older son, and then they have a son that's in the military, and then one still at home. So um, do be praying for them. I know they'd appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, Romans chapter 12 is where we are going to be, and uh, I am going to try to do this without my glasses on. I don't need them to like see to get around or anything like that. Uh, if I start squinting really bad trying to read scripture, I'll probably put them back on, but it helps with the glare. Um, many of you know I use a, a um, tablet to preach from. I don't preach from actual paper. And when I look down, there's a glare up there. There's a little bit of a glare I can even see uh, right now, but I'm trying to minimize that, so hopefully it's not too much of a distraction. Uh, my squinting might become a distraction. I don't know, trying to trying to read, but uh, we're going to try it a little bit, see how it works. If it gets too bad for me, I'm going to put them back on. I got them right over here. Uh, but anyway, just let you know what's what's going on there. Maybe totally irrelevant to you, uh, and that's fine. Uh, we're going to have a word of prayer and ask God's blessing uh, on uh, the message here. I trust you have your Bible there ready, and uh, trying to minimize distractions as much as possible. And that's hard to do, I know, at home. But um, I encourage you to try to do that as much as possible. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to broadcast a Bible message, Lord, out today. Despite the inclement weather and not being able to assemble at the building, uh, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I pray that you guide us and help us. Uh, Lord, we want you to do the work you desire to do in our hearts. We want to be yielded to you. And uh, Lord, just... Speak to our hearts from the Word of God, and may the thoughts uh, that we look at today strengthen us and help us uh, to better know you and love you and serve you. Uh, Lord, to have a pure walk, uh, to walk uprightly and uh, before you. Guide us and help us, we pray. Uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to grab my Bible here. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. And a familiar passage, I think, to all of us. Paul says, <clears throat> Here I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want you to go back to verse 2 and notice what it says. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We've been talking about these hooks in particular. We've been dealing uh, with this matter of the voices of our world, the voices of our culture, and we uh, talked about uh, the matter of music. We, we brought that up last week. And, you know, we get into these thoughts, and you think about what Paul wrote to the Romans here in, in verse number 2 of, of Romans 12. There is a battle that is going on. It's a battle of conformity. Uh, the world... The culture, it's under the control of Satan, and he is desiring to conform us to a particular image. He, he wants us to look a certain way. It's, it's kind of like the battle that, that Daniel and the three Hebrew children had uh, there in Babylon. You remember Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and Daniel. They brought them uh, to Babylon, and you know they were going to change their diet. They changed their names. They were trying to conform them to the culture uh, of the day, and uh, they... Uh, uh, worked extremely hard to try to remove any any part of uh, their background and their heritage uh, as being Jews and, and, and from Jerusalem. So today we face a similar battle, the battle of conformity today. A man by the name of um, David uh, Kinnaman, he wrote a book, and uh, the title of the book is Faith for Exiles. This is what he said, I'm going to quote this, he said, digital screens and the logarithms that orchestrate their flickering pixels know you better than you know yourself. He went on to say this, actually the marketers behind the logarithms know who they would like you to be so they can sell you things. Now, you, if you're on social media, if you're on the internet for any length of time, uh, you're interconnected with all different types of things. If you have any type of account, uh, uh, if you have a Google account or you have a Facebook account or whatever the case may be, uh, you, you often find out that there's ads that are triggered by your searches. And whenever you're watching something, uh, then a lot of times those those ads, the ads that you look for products, they show up. They show up in your Facebook feed. 
uh, if, if you've even used a keyword or something, all those different logarithms. And, and so they're, they're out for that. So the next time you, you go to watch a YouTube video and there's an ad in front of it, uh, you, you know, think about that. What is, what are they trying to, <laughs> what, 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 what identity is, is being sold here? Uh, uh, what, what, what's happening when you're scrolling through your, your Facebook feed or whatever the case may be. The, the truth of the matter is that Satan knows us better than we know ourselves at times. Uh, in other words, Satan knows what he like for us. He knows what he wants to try to conform us uh, to be. Uh, he uses all different types of objects. You may be having one in your hand. You may be looking at one. Uh, obviously, on a, you're looking at some screen. Uh, he knows exactly what to use. And I'm not against these things. Obviously, we're using them. But he uses the things in the physical world to, to feed our hearts. If we're not careful, to really feed our hearts with the spirit of error. We have to be discerning, extremely discerning. And we talked about the fact that one of the most powerful voices that he uses is, is excuse me, is music. Music. <clears throat> he uses it very successfully uh, to corrupt hearts with the spirit of error. You know, there's that battle between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And, and we have said that music is important. Music is important, and we identified six principles last, last Sunday. We said all music is spiritually significant in the heart. Uh, we said all music, without words, has moral or immoral implications. We talked about the fact that the secular world understands the power of music. Uh, the spirits of the world, we talked about, run from godly music. We used illustration of, of Saul and David there. Uh, we talked about the fact that music and culture is is everywhere. It is constantly speaking. I just took notice of it yesterday. My family and I, we were out and about a little bit and in and out of different stores and things, and, and you could just hear it. Uh, it's, all, it's all about you. It's constantly speaking. Uh, worldly music takes uh, small heart problems and enlarges them. So we have to remember that ultimately Satan's desire is to completely destroy uh, our spiritual purpose and our spiritual significance. So I want you to, to think about some things this morning. Uh, think about submitting our heart to God's voice. So the world's voice is all around us. But what about submitting our heart to God's voice? A man by the name of uh, Dana Everson. Dana is the father of Ben Everson. Some of you may be familiar with Ben Everson and his music. Uh, Dana Everson wrote a book. The title of the book is Sound Roots, Steps to Building a Biblical Philosophy of Music. He said the following in this book. He said, we live in a society that sees very few connections in many areas. And then he went on to say this. The Bible contradicts the way most people, even Christians, live by proclaiming connections between our view of God and every other area of life. He finished the statement this way, music is included in the connections, <clears throat> excuse me, but it may very well be the least examined area of a Christian's life. Believers desperately need to realize that God's word demands us to make wise choices, even in entertainment. Then he asked this question, how dare we think music is exempt from examination? Now, think about musical styles. God's word is relatively silent. It doesn't really ad address one certain musical style over another certain musical style, especially the styles that exist today. Uh, so how do we know? How do we know what kind of music to listen to? Well, well, we have to use scripture and biblical principles, even though it doesn't say, thou shalt not listen to such and such music. That doesn't say that. So how do I do it? Just like any other area of life, you know? Uh, what do we what do we use? We have to use principles that we find within the Word of God. Principles that are there. Uh, someone has said musical styles are, are kind of like clothing uh, styles. What does that mean? They they're constantly changing from one culture to the next culture. Uh, music is a creative medium. It's always being discovered and rediscovered, designed and redesigned, if you will. Therefore. You know, if we're going to ask God now, I want you to pin down the exact type of music and tell us exactly what it is we're supposed to listen to, spell it out for us in black and white, put it in big bold letters, and tell us exactly what it is, that, that'd be impractical uh, uh, for, for future generations because the devices of men uh, have newer styles. So 
what the most popular type of music today is relatively uh, uh, hasn't been that way. It hasn't been around very long, if you will. So similarly, uh, with, with clothing, God doesn't say, you know, thou shalt wear a suit to church. He, do, he doesn't say that. Now, you know, we'll say, well, pastor, why do you wear? Why are you sitting there in a coat and tie on a, uh, on a Sunday, snowy Sunday morning in your house? Why, why are you doing that? Well, why am I doing that? I'm doing that because one thing is the fact of the matter is I've been, I've been trained to do it. I've been taught to do it. Uh, I, I believe this, I, this has always been my feeling it may not be your feeling. That's okay. But my feeling is I always, we always, always ought to dress our best. And that may not be a suit and tie. That may not be what, that may not be the best you have. Uh, sometimes it's just traditionary things. It's what people have done and they pass it on this generation, this generation, this generation, and people just do it for tr traditionary things. So what's the biblical principle in it all? What, what, what does the Bible have to say, uh, uh, about it? Well, uh, first Timothy chapter two, I'm not going to turn to all the scriptures. I, I have lots of scriptures I could turn to this morning, but just for sake of principle, first Timothy chapter two and verse number nine. Uh, the Bible uh, speaks here, it says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair uh, or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, is he saying that there's something wrong with uh, uh, gold or pearls or, or costly arrays or something wrong with jewelry in and of itself? No, no, he, that's not the point. What's the point? The point is back here, that you to adorn yourself. Now he's speaking specifically about women here, but the truth of the matter is it, it carries over to men too. Uh, in what? Modest. Modesty. There's the principle. The principle about dress is modesty. God says to be modest in your dress. In other words, be distinct. There ought to be a distinctiveness between a man and a woman. That, that, that ought to be clear. God's, God's certainly drawn a distinction there, and there ought to be a distinction. So, don't let the fact that God doesn't address specific styles in Scripture become a reason to abuse the liberty that we have in Christ. Don't, don't let it do that. Don't abuse that, that liberty. Don't move that liberty over to license, if you will. God gives principles that apply to music, and they're very clear. Okay, so what are they? What are those principles? Well, let me give you a few. Godly music oh, assists the work of the Holy Spirit. Godly music assists the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, familiar verse, I would say, to uh, uh, most of us, many of us. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled, in other words, controlled. Don't allow, Paul's point, don't allow the wine, the alcohol to control you, but allow the Spirit of God to control you. Right? That's, that's the point behind what Paul's saying. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, just a few pages over. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. The Word of God says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So, godly music assists the work of the Spirit of God. Uh, let's, let's think about a couple thoughts uh, under that. Our music should reflect... A new, no, a, a new song, excuse me, after salvation. Our music should reflect a new song after salvation. So what, am I, what am I talking about? Well, uh, go with me to the Psalms for just a moment. Psalm 40. Forgive me. Forgive me if I read before you get there. Uh, Psalm 40 and uh, verse number 2. Psalm 40, verse number 2. The Bible says, He brought me up, up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock and establish my goings. Verse 3 says, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. He's given us a new song. What, what does that mean? That means my music ought to be different now as a believer than it was before I came to know Christ. That that There should be an obvious difference. Their old things are passed away, Paul said. All things are become new. I, I'm no longer my own. I've been bought with a price, Paul wrote in, in 1 Corinthians. I belong to God. So that means everything about my life. Okay, not just today, not just Sunday, not just Wednesday evening, okay, uh, not just when I sit down to, to do my Bible reading. No, everything about my life, all of that should be at God's discretion. All of it should be for His glory. In other words, I should live for His glory in every detail of life, whether for you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So the Bible says. 
So our music should reflect a new song. Our music should be different. Be not conformed to this world, but be a transformed. It should be different from the world. Most what is called contemporary. Okay, so l let me say, let me give you what I believe. All contemporary music is not evil. Contemporary, what does it mean? It means new. Now, if you're talking about the contemporary Christian music movement, I am not for that. I'm not for that. But if you're just talking about contemporary music as far as new music, uh, th there's nothing wrong with good sound music that's new, that's written. There's there's people who are writing very well uh, musical pieces. They're done, they're done very well, and they bring honor to the Lord. There, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but most contemporary Christian musicians are following and conforming in close step to the world when it comes to style and delivery of their music. Uh, just to give you, a, for instance, there's a Christian rock band. I, I don't know anything about them. Their, their name is Skillet. Kind of weird for me to have a... Anyway, but anyway, they, they, they it is said about them, they have this song that's titled, This is the Kingdom. And this was the description that was written about this song. Mm -hmm. They pound out the Beatitudes with a heavy... Imagine Dragons-esque percussion groove. Imagine Dragons is the name of an alternate rock band. And so they're saying they're beating out this song like that alternate rock band, rock band beats out their songs. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't Peter say we're supposed to be a peculiar people? And rather than being a peculiar people who are different from the world, it sounds like they're trying to be like the world. Uh, you know, the world doesn't need, you've heard me say this, and it's not original with me, but the world doesn't need a religious imitation of itself. It, it doesn't need that. We appear like we envy the world. Uh, we're, 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 we're trying to work overtime, if you will, to, to make Christianity like the world. That's, that's, not what, that's not what the gospel is all about. That's not what the Christian life is all about. We are to be different. We are to be peculiar. That that brand of Christianity walks so so close in step with the world. It, it offers no difference, except in what we might say the most the most basic moral concepts. Uh, so, what what does that happen? Well, people in secular society, people in the the media, uh, to them, Christianity appears to want exactly what the world already has, and does much better at, if you will. In other words. If that's the brand of Christianity we're going, to, we're going to try to give to the world, why would they want it? They already have it, and, and, and it's better. Conforming to the world is no way to reach the world. It does, it, that, is not, that is not a biblical point. That is not a biblical principle to live by. So our music should reflect a new song after we trust Christ. Our music should be different from the music uh, that the culture and the world is, is, is giving Third thing, our music should be songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. And back in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 19, that's exactly what Paul tells the believers in Ephesus. He says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, right after he said, be controlled, be filled with the Spirit, he said, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Back over there at Colossians 3, we read the verse a moment ago. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. And again, he says, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There it is. So spiritual songs do what? They speak to the heart about God, both in words and in style, right? So let's think about music without words for just a minute. It has three distinct parts. It has melody, it has harmony, it has rhythm. Those three things. So most of the world's music, what the world likes to listen to, what the world propagates, okay, that's what we're going to determine is the world's music. It speaks to the flesh. It speaks to the flesh with, with rhythm and that, that, that vulgarizes human existence uh, with sensuality. A man by the name of Hal Zeiger, he was one of the first promoters of the rock music industry. Uh, back in the 50s, he he gave an, an interview to Life magazine, and there was an article that was published back in 1968. This is what he said, 1968, 50 years ago. He said, I knew that there was a big thing here that was basic, that was big, that had to get bigger. This is his quote. I realized that this rock music got through to the youngsters because the big beat matched the great rhythms of the human body. 
Because I understood that. I knew it. And I knew there was something that any that n there was nothing, excuse me, I knew there was nothing that anyone could do to knock that out of them. And I further knew that they would carry this with them the rest of their lives. That's what he said back in 1968. So what happens? Trying to put Christian words to those rhythms doesn't change the carnal message of the rhythms themselves because they're spiritual in nature. We talked about that. The wrong spirit, spirit of error. What do the rhythms do? What do those rhythms of that type of music do? It stirs up anger, hatred, despair, bitterness, depression, sensuality, lust. Well, what about the spiritual songs, the hymns and psalms and spiritual songs? The spiritual songs that the scripture speaks of, they they would not take uh, our heart or our body in that type of direction. But the most popular music today, even that which claims to be Christian, does exactly that. It takes the heart in that same direction, bitterness and anger and depression and sensuality and lust. Our music shouldn't be like that music. It, it should not be... Uh, adjusted to the culture, if you will. It should be psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Our music should be joyful. It should be joyful. Uh, Psalm 95. Psalm 95 and verse number 1. Psalm 95 and uh, verse number 1. Notice what the Word of God says here. Psalm 95, verse 1. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Verse number 2 says... Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. We, we could look at others um, throughout the psalms. God's spirit will guide us if we will give him total freedom, if we allow him entrance into our lives. If we have a seeking and we have a submitted heart, then God's Holy Spirit will guide us into the truth. It will guide us away from error. Our music should be joyful. And then we must die to self and submit to God in our musical choices. Uh, the book of Galatians, chapter uh, chapter 2, verse number 20. Galatians, chapter 2, and uh, verse number 20. And uh, notice what the Word of God says here in Galatians 2, uh, verse 20. Familiar verse, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If we're not careful, we start living the Christian life in a my way attitude. How many people select music in that attitude? My way. In other words, it's my preference. It's, it's my taste. And that gets deeply entrenched in our lives. We have favorite pet areas of our heart, and that's one of them. And, and, and we're reluctant to allow God to, to get too close to our comfort zone. We would just rather take our favorite style of music, our, our pet style of music, and, and, and bring it over into Christianity than risk having God replace it with a new song. Many people think music is just, it's just, it's a preference. It's a personal choice. It's based upon what whatever you like, you know, whatever your flavor is. Someone has asked this, since when did what we like become our method of determining what is right? Since when... Does what we like become the method of determining what's right? A man by the name of Gary Reamers, he wrote a book, the title of it, The Glory Do His Name, What God Says About Worship. He said this, Some are unwilling to submit to God's word, considering it too restrictive on their lifestyle. They essentially live for self during the week, doing what pleases them, even if that means disobeying the Lord. How many Christians live that way? I'm going to do what I want. I'll give God Sunday. I'll give him Wednesday, but I'm going to do what I want through the week. Now, what does music produce in the heart? What does music produce in the heart? A man by the name of Daniel uh, Levitin, he wrote a book titled, This is Your Brain on Music. You, you remember seeing the old commercials back in the 80s, This is Your Brain on Drugs and then Frying the Egg, right? Well, he wrote a book titled, This is Your Brain on Music, The Science of Human Obsession. He said this, I feel reluctant to give in to the seduction of music created by so disturbed a mind and so dangerous or impenetrably hard a heart as his, for fear that I might develop some of the same ugly thoughts. He went on, When I listen to the music of a great composer, I feel that I am in some sense becoming one with him. 
or letting a part of him inside of me. I also find this disturbing with popular music because surely some of the purveyors of pop are crude, racist, sexist, or all three. Let's go back to the Old Testament for just a moment. The book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. And notice what the Word of God says here in Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, verse number 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people of the, uh, and Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. They said, look, this is what God has commanded. This is what we're going to do. We're going to be obedient to God. Now I want you to fast forward to chapter 32, Exodus. Exodus chapter 32. Fast forward up there, if you would, to that place. Exodus 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which will go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto him, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Drop down to verse uh, number 7, Exodus 32, 7. The Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So you go 13 chapters, and what's happened? All that the Lord has said, we will do. And then, where do you get to? Well, look in verse 25, Exodus 32, uh, 25. Notice what it says. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. That's, that's where they ended up. They were in shame among their enemies. They went from people who said, all that the Lord has said we will do, to now being in shame before their enemies. What was part of that? What, what influenced that? Well, look back at verse 17, Exodus 32, 17. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. Were they singing the Lord's song? No. No, they weren't. Now, you might argue, you might say, well, music was a product. It wasn't the cause of Israel's problems. Could we also say that music was a type of fuel that added to, if you will, the spiritual mess that the Israelites found themselves in? Let me give you just a couple of thoughts in closing. <clears throat> a person's lifestyle will always be a part of the, uh, the product of their music. A person's lifestyle will always, in part, be the product of the music they listen to. Any indictment against a particular style of secular or what might be called Christian music is the lifestyles of those who popularize that music. I mean, for any style of music, you can look closely at those who live with that music, those who perform that music, those who even worship that music. What, what is their lifestyle like? What is it like? Second point, you cannot immerse yourself into a musical style without being shaped, formed by that style. In other words, that's another universal law. If you want to know what rap music produces, look at its worshipers. Look at its followers. What does it produce? Violence, rage, anger, hatred, defilement, sexual perversion, sexual violence. It's, it's no coincidence that this music comes with warning labels. It's unthinkable to take music like that and somehow stick Christian on it and make it Christianized. There's no way, no way that that style of music that, that produces immoral and godless behavior can ever be labeled as Christian, any of it. Uh, what about other musical styles? They, they produce lust and immorality and loose living, sensuality, adultery. Uh, some styles produce despair and depression and self-absorption. Some produce uh, altered states <clears throat> of consciousness and new age mysticism. Some styles contribute to worshiping Satan himself. Uh, some styles, sensual romance and, and carnal living. What am I saying? Look at the product. Look at the product, and you find the answer. Every style produces its own product within its followers, its worshipers, regardless of whether there's Christian lyrics or not. 
carnal music, here's the third principle, carnal music enlarges and feeds the problem of the flesh until they are consuming. Now, we would agree that our flesh produces these things and not the music. That's where it begins. That's where it begins. But the music is a type of fuel. It ignites the spark. It is a spiritual work that's being done. Rather than transforming the heart in the image of Christ, carnal music enlarges and it feeds the problem of the flesh until it's all consuming. So, against the grain of this culture in which we live, there are some styles that do not produce any of those things we just talked about. Rage, violence, sexual perversion. It doesn't produce any of that. So, as you study, if you give yourself to it, you're not going to find greed or lust or anger or bitterness or violence being produced by godly styles of music. It doesn't work that way. You will find the fruit of the Spirit that's produced through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You won't find confusion in godly music. You'll find peace. Now, this kind of music may not be, well, that's just not my thing, you know. I just don't like that. That style's just not mine. But that style will not conform you to the world. It will not conform your heart to the world. It will not warp your spiritual senses. It may not have the same taste as the world's music, but it will produce a different fruit. It will produce a joyful heart, a healthy countenance, a peaceful life. Your, your fleshly taste buds may reject it at first, but not everything that tastes bad, at least at first, is bad for you. And not everything that tastes good is good for you. We know that, right? Especially, remember we're talking about these hooks, especially when, when the devil uses that bait out there, that worldly music. So, in closing, let's think about a couple things. We, we need to ask ourselves, will we, will we do some things? Will we submit our will to God? Will we submit our will to God and apply biblical principles <clears throat> to our music, our entertainment choices? Will we purify our heart by getting rid of the wrong music and the wrong entertainment in our life? Will we consider, will we think about, will we comprehend the lifestyle that that music or that entertainment produces? And then will we do this? Will we seek God for discernment so we can hear His voice, the voice of the Spirit of truth? May God help us. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the time together. Thank you for your word and these principles. Help us with our music. Help us with our entertainment choices, Lord. It may not be what we have developed taste for. But Lord, help us to look at the fruit. And if the fruit is fruit of corruption, if the fruit is fruit of error, Lord, may we turn from it. May we turn to the truth. May that new song, Lord, may it cultivate and flourish in our hearts. May we turn from that spirit of error, the spirit of truth. I wonder this morning, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and maybe this morning God has spoken to your heart. Why don't you just take a moment right now, ask the Lord to help you. Maybe you know there's some things that you use as entertainment that really... They are the devices of Satan. And Satan's trying to conform your heart and you need to yield your heart to God. Why don't you ask God to help you? Ask Him to help you. Give you a new song. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the truth of your word. May this truth burn deep in our hearts as believers. Forgive us, Lord, for where we have been feeding the flesh and not feeding the spirit. Cleanse us and help us, we pray, in our entertainment and our music choices. Help us to yield to you, Lord. We want to have the fruit of the spirit. That's what we want to produce. Guide us and help us, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. I appreciate you listening and watching this morning. And again, be watching about 2 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. We'll give you... Um, an update on what's going to happen this evening uh, and, uh, and if there is no in-person service then there will be a message posted at 5 p.m. Uh, this evening 
uh, Bible message from the Word of God. All right? God bless you again. Appreciate you listening and, and watching along. Have a great afternoon.